Amen. Let us know in the comments if this conversation encouraged you, helped you, challenged you, stretched you. Uh, I mean, that's the whole purpose of an interview like that for our prayer conference, because oftentimes social justice can seem like uh, something that matters only in the world, but I believe it's something that's on the heart of God. And I believe that um, prayer is part of the solution going after it. So uh, one thing I want to share quickly before I invite up the next speaker real quick, uh, one of my friends, he jokingly reached out to me earlier this week, and he said, man, Pursuit has, um, you know, this person from this camp, but then a totally different person from another camp, and he was saying only Pursuit would do something like that. And, and that is our heart. Our allegiance isn't to a certain theology or to a certain denomination or to a certain type of church. Our heart is committed to the kingdom of God. Uh, our picture is, uh, I think Jim Wallace says it in the interview, Revelations chapter 7, where it's every tribe, nation, and tongue worshiping the Lord. Uh, our heart isn't committed to the Korean church or the white church or the black church, but it's the capital C church. And I think the only way we're able to go after that is listening to other voices. So you see in Genesis how the issue is the Tower of Babel coming together, and it's one language trying to build their own thing. But when Pentecost happened and the Spirit of God falls, it's tongues being heard in every single language because we believe that revival includes every single creed, every single color, every single race, no matter what your background is. And, and that's why we wanted to present it uh, this way. And, and I believe our next speaker is going to help us even more and challenge us and help us understand the heart of God in this matter. Uh, it's such a privilege and honor to have uh, Kelvin Walker with us this year. Um, he is an amazing man of God. He's a worship leader. I think that's the first time I ever uh, met him was when he was leading worship at chapel at seminary. He was also my professor. Thank you for passing me, right? I, I still remember... Uh, um, one of the things that he did in, in the worship class about the woman that Jesus, uh, when, when Jesus says to the woman, um, you know, it isn't proper to give bread to a dog. And he broke that down where I thought he was about to do an altar call, but he did a pop quiz instead. But, uh, you know, I forgave him for that. But uh, he's been a pastor, a professor, uh, a friend. We went to Ireland together, which was life changing. Um, and he is a leader of leaders and an amazing voice. He's the uh, currently the super district superintendent of the Metro uh, District of the CNMA, and uh, it's, it's such a privilege and honor to have him with us. So in the comments, you know, put some fire emojis as we invite up our next speaker, Kelvin Walker. Thank you. It's good to be here with you, to be a part of uh, this time uh, to be with a group of people who are pursuing prayer, pursuing God's presence, but uh, not only just pursuing his, his presence and pursuing, uh, pursuing him in prayer and, and seeking his revival, but also pursuing his heart. And sometimes when we pursue his heart, he opens up our eyes to see things that we may not have seen or uh, look at things in a different way. Uh, I think what he does is he opens up our heart to see things more fully. Uh, we, we see pieces of the gospel, but then God shows us the full picture of the gospel as we pursue him. Uh, the question then becomes, are we going to lean into what he shows us? Are we going to answer his call? And I think we're at a time uh, and we're on a precipice. Uh, Jim Wallace in his, in his uh, interview that you just saw said we're at a chirotic moment in the church where I believe God is showing us a fuller picture of the gospel. And it's not so much that God isn't showing us. The question is, are we going to follow his heart? Are we going to answer his call? Or are you going to pursue the things that are on his heart and pursue the, the things that are, are causing him to grieve? Um, or are we simply going to say, this is the way that we do it. We want, we want his presence. We want his power. But we don't necessarily want to practice the things that he shows us. And so I'm going to invite you to journey with me through the book of, uh, not the book, sorry, uh, the, 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 the chapter of Isaiah 58. 
We're going to be looking at uh, uh, the, the chapter verses 1 through 12, but there, there are two verses in particular that I want to focus on for our time. As we, as we go through it, we'll read the, some other verses, but here's the key, here are the two key verses that we want to look at. Uh, Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6 through 7 say this, Is this not the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? As we look at this passage, what we're looking at is this idea of vertical and horizontal. Vertical and horizontal. Uh, before we move on, would you just join me in prayer? Lord, as we come before you right now, I ask that you would open our eyes so we would see. Open our ears so we would hear. Open our hearts so we would respond. But then open our wills so that we would act. We don't want to be people who just hear your word and take it in and uh, receive it, but we want to act upon it so that our lives with you are in the right place, but our actions for you are born out of that place. Lord, would you be with us now? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I pastored in a church where uh, when I first went there, after about eight months at the church, I mean, I, I had some idea of why I was there, but about, about eight months into being the pastor of the church, uh, I woke up one morning, it was a Sunday morning, preparing uh, to deliver a Mother's Day message, and I had had a dream the night before, and the dream kind of shook me, uh, but it was clear that in that dream, God was speaking, and it was about assignment. So as I'm preparing for, for, for church, uh, one of the things I asked the Lord is, okay, so what's my assignment? And he gave me three things quickly. The first thing at the top of that list was to make this place a place where my spirit feels welcome and free to move. So I begin to work on that. And what I knew was that in order for the spirit of God to be free to move, the, the alignment with God had to be in place. So I spent uh, a good number of time, a good number of, of the first parts of those years just focusing on what would it be like for us to be so open to the move of the Holy Spirit that he could do whatever he wanted to do. The, fo the, the, the focus of what I was doing was all this, my relationship with God, God's relationship with me, and my openness to him and what he was doing. It's funny, when you position yourself that way and you say, God, do what you want to do, he does what he wants to do <laughs> because something happened in the midst of that. My wife and I moved from one house to another house while we were in this, in this, in this church. And it was interesting. This, the new place that we moved was in a, a, a townhouse uh, uh, location. And it looked down. We were kind of up on a hill. And it looked down on the shopping center that was just uh, below where we were. And this was a pretty wealthy community. Um, but as I'm, uh, you know, one day noticing, I'm looking at this shopping center. We could walk to it. There was a, a stop and shop. There was a Target. There were some other stores. It was great location. But all of a sudden, I looked down and I noticed something that I didn't notice before. Every night, there were people who were gathering behind the stop and shop. And they gathered there because they had no other place to go. This is where they slept. So I started to do some research and found out that this particular group of people, there were men uh, were homeless. And they were always homeless at a particular period of, of, of time, uh, usually late fall, early winter. And what I, defined, what I found out was these were migrant workers who during the time that they could work, 
were able to pay weekly for a room. <laughs> and they were also sending money back to whatever country they were, they were from so that they could help support their family. But when winter came, uh, we were in a location where uh, homeless, uh, homeless women and children were, were cared for, but these men were out on the street. And there was an organization in town that, at, that came about because they said, we can't keep watching this. There was a man who had died in the park. He froze to death. And all of a sudden, I realized there's something to this. God is opening my heart for letting his spirit move, but he's also opening my eyes as his spirit moves and is showing me things I hadn't seen before. And we as a church realize we can't just pursue God for ourselves. <laughs> we have to also be aware of the things that are on God's heart. And he began to show me that the idea of loving him the idea of growing in him, the idea of being filled with his spirit, the idea of letting his spirit move and doing this relationship really should have opened my eyes to what was going on around me too. Jesus said it this way when he's asked, what's the greatest commandment? You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength and then love your neighbor as yourself. We look at loving our neighbor as ourselves simply from the perspective of saying, hey, I want to introduce you to Jesus. I want you to come to know Jesus. And that is, that is certainly the heart of the gospel. But it is also the heart of the gospel that as I get to know you as my neighbor, I want you to have life here on earth in the same way that I would have it. And I want for you the same things that I want for myself. And so it becomes very hard to see you in a situation where you're being maligned, oppressed, sidelined, uh, treated with discrimination, and not say anything or do anything about it. I came across this quote. Somebody said this, said this, social ethics must never be substituted for personal ethics. Crusading can easily become a dodge for facing up to one's lack of personal morality. But by the same token, even if I am a model of personal righteousness, that does not excuse my participation in social evil. The man who is faithful to his wife while he exercises bigotry toward his neighbor is no better than the adulterer who crusades for social justice. What God requires is justice, both personal and social. I think what he's trying to say here is that uh, it really comes down to this. Uh, loving God <laughs> should enhance the love of our neighbor. That which happens vertically is also to happen horizontally. Two words for justice uh, uh, in, in, in the Hebrew that stand out to me. Uh, one is the word mish, mishpat, or what I would call retributive justice, making sure that the law is kept and making sure that uh, that, which, that which you do, that you, you, you pay for your actions and, 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 and the law is, is carried out. But then there's another word in the Hebrew, and that's the word tzedakah. And that is what's called distributive justice. That means I look and see what are the needs around me. I look and see what's going on. And I not only give to make sure that the needs around me are met, I give of myself to make sure that I'm addressing those things that are unjust around me. And I think that's what he's trying to say. Uh, if, I, if, I could, if I could put it this way, it was, I'd say this. A gospel that focused solely on the vertical yet ignores or rejects the horizontal is, 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 is not only is it a half gospel, but it's a suspect gospel. For the gospel to be holistic, for the gospel to be all that, that God intends, intends the gospel to be, it must focus on both the vertical and the horizontal. It's not either or, 
it is a both and. This is what I believe God was going after uh, with, with his people that we see in Isaiah 58. Here they are. They are uh, back, in, um, in the back in Jerusalem after they've been in exile in Babylon. They're establishing life as they, as they would have known it or as they would have been told it would have been. Uh, they're, they're doing all of their religious customs. They are uh, making sure that they're working on the vertical. And they're doing that. They're fasting. They're putting on their sackcloth and ashes. They're setting aside the, the Sabbath. They're, they're keeping all the laws. They're going before God. And they expected something from God. We do this for you. And you do this for us. But they had a complaint. And the complaint before God was this. We're fasting and you're silent. <laughs> We're coming before you. We're doing what you've asked us to do, and you're silent. Why have we fasted and you see it not, they say in verse 3. Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? God, we're dotting our I's, we're crossing our T's, we're on our face before you, we are sacrificing for you, and you're quiet. You're not working on our behalf. You're not doing what we ask. We don't see, and I guess if you were talking about, about what it would be like today, God, here we are, we're turning our plates down, we are on our faces before you in prayer, and we're not seeing your power, we're not seeing your glory, we're not seeing you move like we want you to. We're not seeing you do the things uh, from the place of your spirit moving that we want you to do. God, in other words, what they were saying to him is, God, we are sacrificing for you. You owe us. You owe us. We demand to see your power. We demand to see your glory. <laughs> it's interesting. To their complaint, God gives a confrontation. And this is what he said. You're not seeing me move. You're not seeing my power. You're not seeing my glory. Because your fasting is self-centered and unjust. Your fasting is self-centered and unjust. Fasting like yours this day will not make my voice be heard on high. In fact, God says this. Let me read it from Isaiah chapter 58, verses 1 through 2 and then 4 through 5. God says, cry aloud. Do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. And then verse 4, behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice be heard on high. Is the, such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to, to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? In other words, God was saying, you are coming before me you're, you're, you're stripping yourself, putting on sackcloth and ashes. You are sacrificing. You're turning your plates down. You are fasting, and you want me to move, but I'm watching you still oppress those around you. You want me to move, but I'm watching you take a day off, and those who are workers who should still get a day off are working. You want me to move, but I watch you as you quarrel and you fight and you argue with one another. You want me to move, but I watch you as you take care of the vertical and totally ignore the horizontal. And yet you call this a fast. God's saying, I want to move, but I can't move. Or maybe I won't move because you're fast is self-centered. I'm watching you, and you know all of the evils <laughs> that I want to call out, but you choose what evils you're going to call out. Someone put it this way. People do not differ much about what things they will call evils, but they differ enormously about what evils they will call excusable. God said, I'm watching you, <laughs> and you're excusing the evils among you and only calling out those things that make you comfortable. And then you want me to move. He goes on and, and, and he makes it very clear that if you really want to fast, true fasting 
is about that which is on my heart. And what's on my heart is justice. Fast from oppression, do justice. Continues on in verses six through seven, he says, and we read this earlier. Is this not the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh? God's calling them out. You want me to move. I want to move. You're fasting, but you're still oppressing people. You're turning your plate down, but you're still acting in unjust ways. <laughs> you are staying away from the food. You are sacrificing, and you are going without because you want me to move and yet you choose what you call out as wrong or unjust among you. That is not my heart. That is not my heart. And so God gives them a conclusion. If you will do that which is just, if you will call out the oppression that's among you, then your cries will be heard and your life in me will be pleasing. Uh, this is how he, how, he, how he sums it up. Look, I, I, want you to, I want you to call out the oppression that's among you. I want you to stay away from it. Uh, I want you to, to not only stay away from it, but I want you to do that which is just. Zedekiah among you. I want to make sure that you are looking to the things around you that are not being distributed well. I want to make sure that you're looking around you and making sure that those who are oppressed and those who are, are, are being held down, those who are being discriminated against, those who are being sidelined, those who are being marginalized. I want to make sure that you are not only worried about yourself, but you're concerned for the welfare of others. This is what he says will happen to his people when we do that. Isaiah 58, verses 8. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall speed up, spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. I love that. God says, if you do justice, I will have your back. You don't have to worry about anybody else having your back. I'll have your back. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. And you shall rise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of the streets to dwell in. God says, you want to hear me? You want me to act? Don't just worry about yourself. Do right by others. And when you see wrong being done to others, speak out against it. That's when you will see the light break through. That's when you will see my power come forth. That's when you will see me move in a way that is incredible. And you can do it without fear because you know I'll have your back on this. I'll have your back on this. Repairer of the breaches. Um, I firmly admit that I am not good at home repair. <laughs> Uh, I, my idea of home repair is that I like to look through the phone book, find out who the closest person is to repair it and give them a call and then write a check and hand it over to them. But every once in a while, I get this idea that I know what I'm doing. Uh, it's usually when you see a crack in the wall and, and you think, oh, the only thing I need to do is put some spackling over it, sand it down, make it smooth, and then paint over it and it's, and it's fine. So I, I think I'm good at that. Here's what I've discovered over the years. I can do that, and somehow that crack appears again. I fixed it. I've spackled over it. I've sanded it down. Why is it coming back? 
So I've all had to go back to my first statement. I like to call people to come check it out. I always find myself calling someone to come check it out. What I found over the years is that when you see a crack in the wall and you spackle over it, you might fix the problem temporarily, but you, you, you haven't really gotten to the root. There is a breach somewhere that has been broken and you've got to get to where that breach is because that breach is the foundation of the problem that's manifesting as a crack. Once you get that done, you may have to monitor it to make sure that it stays in good repair, but you can't just fix it. You can't just spackle over it. You have to go to where the root is and then you repair it. God was saying to his people, you putting on sackcloth and ashes is like you spackling over a crack in the wall. And what I'm calling you to do is to get to the breach, get to the root. And the root of the problem is injustice. The root of the problem is oppression. You repair that breach, you don't have to worry about spackling over the cracks anymore. You repair that breach, you don't have to worry about who has your back. You repair that breach, you don't have to worry so hard about making sure your witness shines forth as light in the midst of darkness. You repair that breach, you don't have to worry about what the streets will look like because you'll be the reclaimer of the streets. You repair that breach and you will see me move in ways that I have never moved before. Stop spackling over the crack and just focusing on the vertical. <laughs> Catch a picture of my heart and show that the transformation I do vertically is also manifested horizontally. But that doesn't manifest unless you are willing to look. Here's the call that he gave to them. Rebuild the ancient ruins. Raise up the foundations of justice for future generations. That's, that's another key thing. If you do justice, and you set that foundation of justice, and you go after the foundation that has been broken and repair that foundation of justice, then the generations that come after you will understand how to do justice. Repair the foundation of justice for future generations. Repair the breaches and restore the streets for dwelling. Then your light will bring shine forth. Friends, this is what kingdom justice and mercy is all about, rebuilding raising up, repairing, and restoring. And you might think, well, that's, that's great. What does that have to do with us today? 2020 has not been the year that any of us anticipated. We've seen this pandemic take lives. We've seen this pandemic uh, just go after economics. This has not been the year that we intended it to be. But I would also say that 2020 uh, has also revealed another pandemic. And it's not just something that's come up recently. 2020 has revealed the pandemic that has shown us that there needs to be a repair of the breach in our country. But I'll also go a little further in the church. The breach of racism, injustice, socioeconomic oppression. We see it. It's happened. We can give case after case after case. It seemed like there was a two week period where we were hearing, particularly in the black community, uh, one story after another of injustice and racism. But I'd go even further. Something that broke my heart during the, uh, during the, the real uh, the, the uprising, I guess you would say, or the, the out, outcry in the midst of the uh, pandemic, something that broke my heart was what was happening to my Asian brothers and sisters, being spat on, being attacked. Things said to them, 
uh, about this, this, this flu, this virus, and being blamed. Friends, let's call it what it is. That was flat out racism. And the church's voice needed to be the loudest in speaking against it. And where we are today, when we look at racism and we look at socioeconomic oppression, people without the kind of health care that they need, uh, uh, we are in a financial crisis, whether or not we want to admit it. God says, this is what I call you to speak out against. This is what I call you to say, this cannot be. And we can't just put spackling over it by simply saying, well, let's just love each other. That's not going to work. God says, you get to the breach. You call out the breach. You say, this is not God's heart. You speak out against the oppression that's happening. And you will watch me do through the church and in the church and because of the church things that the world has never seen before. This is not just a vertical relationship. It's vertical and horizontal. Why is it a both and? Because if we're simply going after the vertical, then as he was saying to, to his people, um, that could be pretty self-centered. It could all be, only be just about you. Or there's another thing that sometimes happens. When I'm just doing this, sometimes I can get my own uh, religious way of doing things going, and it develops just a kind of a legalistic way of going after God. So that's, that's if we just go vertical. If we just go horizontal, that sometimes produces what I would call uh, mere humanitarianism. And I just do what I do because it is the right thing to do uh, by humans. God's calling us to do both. Love me with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. When you do this and you allow my spirit to work and flow through you, then I give you my eyes. I give you my heart. And you go after the things that represent injustice and oppression and racism. You go after them because you know that from a biblical standpoint, this is not what God calls his people to be involved in. But this is what God calls his people to speak out against and to model a different way. Sometimes we look at these things and we say, okay, well, that's, that's a lot of Old Testament. That, 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 that sounds good. Uh, where's Jesus in that? Well, very interesting to me. In Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 16, Jesus begins to announce his ministry. Jesus begins to announce what it is that his kingdom will be about. Jesus begins to reveal to those in the temple and who are in his hearing what it is that the Spirit of God has anointed him for. Listen to these words. Verse 16 of Luke chapter 4. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up, up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. These words. The spirit of the Lord, the sovereign Lord, is upon me because he has anointed me to pray, pro proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Maybe you need something else from uh, the New Testament. John chapter 4, the passage on worship that we always go to. I love that passage. Jesus reveals himself as Messiah to the Samaritan woman. Uh, he, he makes it very clear that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But what I love about that passage also, as I look at it, it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. He didn't have to go through Samaria. In fact... People did everything they could to go around Samaria. They didn't, do, they didn't do Samaria. Why? Because they didn't like Samaritans. They couldn't stand Samaritans. There were racial issues against Samaritans. And I love what Jesus does. He goes through because in his relationship with the Father, the Spirit leads him through Samaria. 
he not only goes through Samaria, but he encounters a Samaritan woman at the well. She's there by herself at noonday. She's probably chosen that time because she doesn't want to be encountered by anyone. And here he is having a conversation with her. He says he's thirsty. She, he asks for a drink. She knows that if I give him something to drink with that is, that is from my hands, that is a Samaritan cup, he's going to make himself unclean. That's why she asks, do you have anything to draw water with? I can't, you know, I'll draw it, but do you have anything to draw water with? The whole encounter that's there that Jesus is talking, talking with her about, here's what I would submit to you is going on. For everyone who's watching, he's saying um, the racism that's gone on against Samaritans, not of my kingdom. I would also submit to you that the culture of the day and the way that women were oppressed and treated, he's saying the oppression that's going on against this woman, it's not of my kingdom. Here's a third thing. The disciples were sent while they were there to go find lunch. We got to find, we got to feed people. Okay. If I'm sent to go find lunch, that means the money that I have to buy lunch with is going to be spent in this community. Remember, people went around Samaria so that they didn't encounter Samaritans. That means the economic resources that could have helped Samaritans was not even put into the community. And here's Jesus saying, here we are. I'm addressing racism. I'm addressing oppression. I'm addressing the economic injustices here. There's so much in scripture that God shows for us to see that oppression Racism, systemic injustice is not a part of his kingdom. It's not a part of his heart. And his people are called to speak out against it. We as God's people are called to, like Jesus, rebuild, raise up, repair, and restore wherever injustice has torn down, beat down, pressed down, and kicked down those who bear the image of their creator. Wherever injustice is present, we must be present to bring the kingdom. We must be intentionally cognizant of and present in the places where injustice has caused lives to be ruined and to bring Christ's kingdom of righteousness and justice to those places. We must be intentionally raising up people who have for generations been oppressed and torn down by the foundations of whose lives have been ripped apart and stripped away by the systemic injustices that they've suffered. We must intentionally be repairing the cracks and the breaches in our justice systems that keep people unjustly locked up and shackled up for years, thereby ruining entire communities for generations. We must be intentionally on the streets wherever injustice is running rampant, exposing it and, and calling it out and bringing to bear the justice and the equity of Christ's Christ kingdom. And finally, we must be people who share the good news of the gospel of the kingdom, declaring and proclaiming and preaching that Jesus has come to seek and to save the lost. I'm a Gen Xer. And my generation has some repenting to do. Because my generation and the generation before me we're given opportunity to be a part of being, of repairing the breaches. And we did this thing where we said, well, no, that's the social gospel. We want to make sure that hearts are transformed for Jesus. And we separated things out. Here we are today. I believe it is a chirotic moment. And God has given us as his people, your generation and the generation coming after you, the opportunity to say, we repent of where the church has gotten it wrong in the past. We refuse to bifurcate or separate this. And we choose to see this from a biblical perspective where it is holistic, where we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we love our neighbor as ourselves. The loving thing is to speak out when things are unjust. I want to challenge you and encourage you. Speak out against injustice. 
Love your neighbor as yourself. Don't let racism run rampant. Don't let the discrimination and the marginalization and the practices that we see go unaddressed by the church. And why is it so important for the church to be involved? Because the church is the only institution, the only movement that has the only answer. Without Jesus, we see humanitarian efforts. But what we do is we step back and we, we criticize rather than saying, let me come alongside. What we do is we step back and we demonize rather than saying, let me bring the fullness of the gospel. Your generation has the opportunity to do that. And what I'd like to do in this closing time is um, lead in a prayer of repentance. Repentance for our absence in places where the church should have been leading the way. Lead in the prayer of repentance for where we have let the breach stay, uh, staying unrepair, un unrepaired. Repentance for the places where we have said, God, we only care about the vertical. We'll let you figure out the horizontal. And then pray a prayer of release. Release of God's spirit over us so that we see what he sees in our hearts, a burden for what burdens his heart. And then ask him to make us people who do justice, who love mercy and walk humbly with our God. And so as I pray, I invite you to join me. Lord Jesus, we repent. We repent of making a mockery of the things that uh, those who don't know you are attempting to do as they are trying to bring about justice. Rather than joining and saying, hey, I have the fullness here, let me join you and let me bring the fullness of what it is that's on the heart of God. We stand back and we criticize and we judge and we even demonize efforts because the things that are being done don't seem to be in alignment with your word. Rather than bringing the fullness of your word, we step back and we hold on to your word. We repent of that, God. And we ask you to give us a heart for the holistic gospel, the gospel that not only transforms the soul for eternity, the gospel that not only brings the fullness of your presence and your power here and now, but the gospel that transforms the lives of people right now, that, that goes after the injustices and goes after the, uh, the racism and goes after the marginalization and says, this does not represent the kingdom of God. Lord Jesus, as a, as a Gen Xer, I repent on behalf of my generation. We were so concerned with making sure that we parse the Hebrew and the Greek so well that we stepped away from the call to do justice. We were so concerned on making sure that we were not giving uh, heretical teachings that we stepped away from your call, which is so clear in scripture to do justice. We are so concerned about making sure that we, we protect the integrity of the inerrancy of scripture as the only rule for faith and practice, that we did not practice what our faith believes. And that is, this is your word. And in your word, you call us to be people who speak out against oppression and injustice. Repent of that, Lord. And I say, we won't be silent anymore. We will not only show Jesus as our savior and our healer and the one who makes us clean and pure and the one who is coming again. We will also show Jesus as the one who ushers in justice, who breaks the, the yoke of oppression, who sets the captives free. Lord Jesus, we repent. We repent of being so self-centered 
that we are missing the communal aspect of your gospel. That this is not just about me, but it is also about us. And when, when we are not thriving as your people, and when, when those around us are not thriving as image bearers, it is our call to speak out. It is our call to rise up and say, we will not allow this to happen. Lord Jesus, we repent of putting on our sackcloth and ashes and then demanding that you move in the way that we want you to move. Lord, you call us to pursue you. You call us to go after you with our whole heart. You also call us to open our eyes and our ears to see and to hear. Lord, I, I, I firmly believe that as we preach, teach, and live out a holistic gospel, true revival will come. <laughs> As we preach, teach, and live out a holistic gospel, your spirit will fall in ways like we've never seen before. I firmly believe that as we preach and teach and live out a holistic gospel, that we will see you move in this land in ways that will blow us away. And the church will take her rightful place leading society, not from a political place, but from a biblical place that brings honor and glory to you. Our allegiance is to you, Lord Jesus. Our heart comes after you and longs after you. We commit to you today that we will be people who love you with our whole heart, with our whole mind, our whole soul, and all of our strength. And out of that, we will be people who love our neighbors as ourselves. We will be people who view all of humanity as image bearers, the imago dei, the image of God in our brothers and sisters, in, in faith and in those around us who have not yet come to faith. And whether a person is a believer or not, we will speak out against injustice. And then we will share the good news of the gospel. This is your heart. And so we pursue your heart in all of its fullness. In Jesus' name.